On April 25, 1953, the structure of DNA was published in the 171st volume of Nature, a British interdisciplinary scientific journal which was first published in 1869. This journal is one of the most cited scientific journals in the world and has published some of the most life-changing articles that have also changed the face of science. In 1932, it published the existence of the neutron. In 1985, we were exposed to the phenomenon of the ozone hole caused by chlorofluorocarbons and other ozone-depleting substances. In 2001, Nature published the results of the Human Genome Project. With the discovery of DNA comes a lot of controversy and important ethical considerations. In an earlier video, we addressed the importance of ethics and research, and I briefly introduced that Watson and Crick used Rosalind Franklin's research and results without her permission. But how did we get here? When we address scientific discoveries, we recognize usually only those who publish the findings first. Charles Darwin, for example, is working on developing the theory of natural selection at the same time as Alfred Russell Wallace was working on his own similar theory. However, the majority of people are not familiar with Wallace's work because Darwin won that race to publish first. Yet Darwin and Wallace were not working in isolation from each other. Both of them co-wrote a paper using lines of evidence from both of their research, Wallace in the Dutch East Indies and Darwin in the Galapagos. It was Darwin's published book on the origin of species that ultimately led each man to their respective fates in history books. Genetics is an incredibly old field of science, whether you realize it or not. Since the earliest hominids, people were investigating heredity. Their quote-unquote experiments, which we are still repeating today, have brought us varieties of canine and bovines through selective breeding. This would not be understood until the 19th century with Gregor Mendel's pea breeding experiments when the modern field of genetics was conceived. Post Mendel, the race for understanding heredity and the biological molecule and control of it would begin. Prior to the discovery of DNA structure, there were many scientists researching DNA. In 1869, a nucleic acid was extracted and identified for the first time by Friedrich Miescher and named them nuclein based on their origins in the nucleus. In 1879, Walter Fleming identified chromatin, a decondensed form of chromosomes, and named them such based on their readiness to absorb stains. In 1911, Thomas Hunt Morgan suggested genes were found on chromosomes. However, chromosomes are composed of both protein and nucleic acid. This initiated a race to determine whether protein or DNA was the molecule of inheritance. There were so many others who contributed to the puzzle of genetics that I would run out of time to introduce their contributions. But DNA was confirmed and accepted as the hereditary molecule in 1928 with Frederick Griffith's experiment with pneumococcus bacteria. This was later confirmed in 1952, one year before Watson and Crick published their research by Arthur Chase and Alfred Hershey's experiments involving radioactively labeled bacterial phages. Collaboration is the key with scientific discoveries and research. Resources for research, ethics, education provides a lot of sound reasons for collaboration, but also the accompanying shortcomings. There is a likelihood for disparate contributions of time, resources, data, and ideas. There can even be conflict in personalities which may delay progress or instigate disagreements. Each of these issues will play a role in this story. Linus Pauling was born on February 28, 1901 in Portland, Oregon. He earned his high school diploma, but only after winning two Nobel Prizes, yet that did not prevent him from attending university anyway. He earned a Bachelor in Science in Chemical Engineering, a Master's involving X-ray diffraction, and a PhD in Physical Chemistry and Mathematical Physics, all by 1925. He would never fully gain notoriety for his work with DNA, but he did receive two Nobel Prizes in his lifetime one in chemistry for the elucidation of protein structure, and two for peace, due to his activism against the use and proliferation of nuclear arms. Francis Crick was born on June 8, 1916, in a small town outside of Northampton, roughly 100 kilometers northwest of London. Like Watson, he eventually switched to the field of genetics after earning his Bachelor's of Science in Physics from University College London, which is also where he began his PhD. At the beginning of his doctoral program, World War II broke out, and Crick used this as his opportunity to get as far away from physics as he possibly could. Maurice Wilkins was born on December 15, 1916, in New Zealand to British parents, and moved to Birmingham, England when he was six years of age. 
Wilkins attended St. John's College of Cambridge University, where he earned his Bachelor's of Science in Physics. He later earned his PhD at the University of Birmingham. Rosalind Franklin was born into prominence on July 25, 1920 in Notting Hill in London. She completed her undergrad at Newnham College of Cambridge University with her major as chemistry. By 1945, she earned her PhD from Cambridge, which she accomplished during her landmark research on the structure of coal. It was also during this time when she refined and perfected the technique of X-ray diffraction with crystallography. The final player of the story is James Watson, born in Chicago on April 6, 1928. As a boy, he became fascinated with birding and began studying ornithology at university. However, he was influenced by Erwin Schrodinger's book, What is Life?, and changed his focus to genetic. But not until after earning his Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of Chicago and his Master's degree and PhD, all in zoology. So here we have five of the main players in the race to revealing the molecular structure of DNA. Watson and Wilkins met in the spring of 1951 at a symposium in Naples, Italy. Until this time, Watson was working in a microbiology lab, but was inspired to shift focus after meeting Wilkins. Watson was already working with x-rays to understand the effect on cellular reproduction, but Wilkins introduced him to x-ray diffraction for the first time. James and Seth began researching nucleic acids and proteins. Shortly after, James met Francis Crick, who was also curious about solving the great DNA mystery. Watson and Crick began researching together at Cambridge University in late 1951. Meanwhile, Rosalind Franklin began researching at King's College in 1951, about 100 kilometers away from Cambridge. She was solicited by Wilkins to assist in the research on DNA there because she was already at the top of her field with X-ray diffraction and crystallography. Unfortunately, this would lead to a rift between Franklin and Wilkins, but I will get to that shortly. On the other side of the pond, in California, Linus Pauling, who had already published a series of papers on the atomic structures of various proteins, turned his sights on nucleic acids. He got so close with his research and developed a model of triple-stranded DNA. In this model, the nitrogenous bases were located on the exterior and the sugar phosphates were located on the interior. This had several flaws, but acted as a catalyst for Watson and Crick's research. In May of 1952, Rosalind Franklin got the best photograph of DNA, Photo 51. Wilkins' intuition that she would be the best person for the position was confirmed. However, Franklin was under the impression that she would be doing research with X-ray crystallography and DNA, and Wilkins believed that Franklin was his assistant. Needless to say, a great deal of tension grew between them. As it turns out, Franklin was intended to have total responsibility over this project. Anyway, Wilkins obtained evidence for DNA having a helical structure. He shared this with Watson and Crick, and these two men caught wind of Franklin's research. Between these pieces of evidence, they generated their first model of DNA with phosphate in the middle. When Watson and Crick took their model to Franklin, she tore it a new one and pointed out all the flaws with it. In 1952, Pauling proposed his triple helix that had a similar structure to Watson and Crick's original model. Now that it was clear, three parties were working on the same research. Each member concentrated their efforts to the discovery. Franklin with her X-ray crystallography, Pulling with his proteins, enzymes, and nucleic acids, and Watson and Crick doing their own thing. Wilkins, on the other hand, invited Watson and Crick to King's College and showed them Photo 51 along with the calculations Franklin made based on the angles. Franklin knew nothing of the matter. Her research was being used without her knowledge or permission. Between their failed model, Pauling's failed model, and, and Franklin's photo, Watson and Crick knew exactly what they had to do to win this race. The final model consisted of cardboard to represent the nitrogenous bases. The double helix consisted of anti-parallel strands, and bases were paired based on the research of Erwin Jargraf. Models, some simple, some very complex, all based on theoretical understanding, are developed to explain processes that may not be observable. Computer-based mathematical models are used to make testable predictions, which can be especially useful when experimentation is not possible. Models tested against experiments or data from observations may prove inadequate, in which case they may be modified or replaced by new models. Watson and Crick had to go through several versions of their model before they got it right. Using Chargraph's data, they were able to pair adenine with thymine and cytosine with guanine. Using the molecular structure of the bases, they determined how the pairs formed hydrogen bonds and that the two strands must run anti-parallel. 
The molecular structure of the bases revealed the pairings were of the same length, allowing them to be nestled between the sugar phosphate backbones. Watson, Crick, and Wilkins were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1962 for their contributions to the discovery of DNA structure. Rosalind Franklin wasn't awarded the Nobel Prize because it is an award that is never given posthumously. She passed away on April 16, 1958, almost five years after the Nature article was shared with the world. From this story, it is clear that there was a great deal of collaboration, both direct and indirect. The big lesson that comes from this is that there must be open communication for successful collaboration. It also helps reinforce the importance of getting permission and giving credit for other people's work. The story of the elucidation of DNA illustrates that cooperation and collaboration among scientists exist alongside competition between research groups. To what extent is research in secret anti-scientific? What is the relationship between shared and personal knowledge in the natural sciences?